where, when it's bare, it's obviously pretty saline and um, it's already marginal. It's, it's great to get in salt tolerant species, light salt bush before it becomes bare. This is a site where at the moment, um, as part of the assessing salt bush for carbon sequestration. So this project was planted in 2023 and the project runs through to 2029. So it's a long-term project to assess the potential of salt bush to sequester carbon in the southwest of Western Australia. There's two plots on each trial site one for assessing densities of saltbush and another one for assessing species of saltbush. This project was planted in 2023 and it runs all the way through to 2029 when Murdoch will be collecting data to give us the final outcomes of how good the saltbush species are at sequestering carbon. So that this species of saltbush behind me are um, Atriplex nummularia or old man saltbush as it's commonly known. Uh, it's quite a common species that's planted throughout the wheat belt um, due to its salt tolerance and, and hardiness um, following um, sheep grazing. We are looking at the ability of different saltbush species to sequester carbon while also mitigating salinity in saline areas. So we're looking at um, old man saltbush and looking at creeping saltbush, which is very prostrate, and river saltbush, which is another pretty old species that's been planted a lot, especially in more saline areas of kind of farming areas, and anameka, which is a new, new cultivar. This area here is typically your valley floor and it's slowly going saline. And you can see from the surrounding landscape that there's lots of York gum eucalypts and there's patches where it's starting to die. So it's becoming pretty marginal for cropping. So we've actually planted a lot of this area to salt tolerant species because we can see that we're going to lose it all to salinity in due course. And because livestock is run on this property, it's potential for feed. It fills a feed gap during that autumn period, um, even late spring when we're taking livestock off um, their fodder areas. The livestock will always you know do really well and sheep and cattle can be quite complementary. The sheep will come in and graze the lower parts and they're quite picky and selective whilst the cattle will just crash graze the um, salt bush right down and, and it always recovers. It's a really resilient bush. We've got, we're actually standing in the density trial that's uh, mounded and unmounted, and this will be testing how much biomass for carbon uh, can be captured and what's the best management practice, I guess, whether farmers go in mounding or just ripping and putting um, salt bush in. So I guess planting to salt tolerant species, you're getting the environmental benefits of soil cover. You're also kind of helping lower or stabilise the water table. Uh, always brings in lots of birds. We've noticed um, the site just to the west here, heap of birds, kangaroos kind of move in. And it kind of feels good when you're driving around and you've got kind of life in an area that was pretty marginal before. Um, yeah, we're really happy with this establishment and I guess once you experience success after grazing and a successful establishment, it just encourages you to do more and more. It, it feels good, your landscape feels resilient and vibrant and it also has its economic benefits. So I guess experiencing the success over there kind of on the six-year-old stand and then this, it just, yeah, you want to do more and more. when they're having success, that drives them to do more. And we all know that we need to plant more trees and we need to plant more uh, native species uh, for, for environmental reasons. But yeah, giving people more reasons to do that is really inspiring. Uh, we are currently in one of those 
uh, salvage carbon sequestration sites uh, here next to Tulvin Lake. Uh, so this is a highly saline area. And this site is a really ecologically important site. So just to the south, there's a lake system, which is a perch wetland, which has some really important uh, endangered species within the system. So this saltbush carbon project is ecologically important, that it's providing a buffer for that system uh, to reduce the salinity and, give, and build a wildlife corridor. Uh, you can see a lot more biodiversity. So the first thing that you use, see when you use get to the site is just to you know animals moving around, a lot more uh, alive things. One of three farmers will tell me that they will lose land through salinity. Uh, so you need to take advantage of it. Super important to uh, focus on how to get the best of marginal land. So that's one of the main purpose of the relevance for, uh, for our farmers. Uh, yeah, Rodney Wilds, he's the landowner. He always mentioned that carbon is an important part of uh, his farm. So it builds value, not from the ACCU perspective, but for the soil benefits. Um, the salinity has been growing in this area. Rod is highly interested to see if you can just control it at some point. Uh, so you can improve the conditions at the same time the soil. Uh, as well, of course, grazing. That's the main benefit of farming. There's a lot of livestock producers who are really, really passionate about saltbush for fodder. The feed gap is, on autumn is one of the main things here, so you can use the whole site just to properly graze it. One of the things that you can do with this site, so you have enough big plantation, you can just let rest your pasture. I get to know by other farmers that they do these plantations in between their, their pasture paddocks, so they can have that easy movement around, which is more efficient. Uh, but I, I reckon that's not a standard practice, but yeah, the, the, the whole purpose is just have more food, let rest your pastures, and you can keep rotating everything. With collaboration, I think you can really accelerate or I guess there's a higher chance of ex success when you've got extension of information across agencies. You know, between FACI Group and Corrigan Farm Improvement Group, we can share what's worked and what hasn't worked and some of the challenges um, with our landholders. And working with Wheatbelt NRM and Murdoch, you know, there's higher chance for them to get that information actually on the ground. The grow groups have a really amazing relationship with their landholders and they work really closely with the growers, they live in the community, they know everyone face to face and that builds confidence in their projects and the growers know that, they are, that the grower groups are trying to do the best thing by them. So yeah, it's a, it's a win-win situation to get the research down to the grassroots level. And this is the long-term research site which was established back in 2001 by Professor Harper at Murdoch University. And it's a, a large trial site that is encompassed in an 80 hectare subcatchment, um, looking at answering a number of research questions relating to landscape hydrology and, and carbon production. And we have um, uh, eucalypt plantings here of swamp yates and of course the uh, salt saltbush plantings behind me. This site here is in its 24th year and you can see behind me that the, the saltbush is still um, growing well and they have developed some woodiness with age which is expected. Over time we have sampled this site throughout the age of the project and some of the earlier and biomass sampling that we did, we estimated that there was approximately 14% edible dry matter. That's the, the leafy material which, which the livestock eat. The remainder of the saltbush is what would be the standing carbon crop that uh, ACUs would be paid for. Interestingly, late last year we did some additional biomass sampling and that edible dry matter appeared to only be 6% at this stage, which implies then as the saltbush mature, uh, the proportion of, of woody biomass or standing carbon stock increases. So through the carbon project itself, looking at the going around to those 30 farms I visited, they're all very keen to see saltbush plantings and, and for a number of reasons to remediate degraded landscape because it 
look terrible and that they wanted their properties to look better. Several of them actually came onto site with me and, and pointed out previous to the saltbush being there, there wasn't any pasture on the ground. Following the saltbush plantings, the pasture recovered. And so these growers were seeing recovery of uh, pastures under, under saltbush. That, that was a benefit to, for them, um, for their productivity essentially, um, separate to whether there was a, a carbon credit. It's great because um, we get the benefits of technical expertise from the university and um, Murdoch gets the benefits of having access to landholders at our field days and showcasing kind of their information and data and um, findings. But at the long term, at least anything that you're losing is not a loss. So you can have some recovery of that because you're going to keep losing marginal land. So you basically lose your money. Uh, if you put salvage, you're at some point just mitigating that that loss uh, and also the beauty of this kind of research uh, and this kind of collaboration that you can also, it can be a gain. Uh, and that's exactly what we're looking here, trying to put some value in carbon, co-benefits, salvage, grazing. What this old study site shows and what the, the, the carbon project showed was that there is the longevity there and um, not just from a productivity point of view, but uh, to recover, to remediate the landscape. States well, I mean that on that side is more so lines, so it's better. But yet, if I was cheap, I would eat it. <laughs>